This unit of S244 Field Observer and Fire Effects Monitor presents advanced skills for making environmental observations to assist in verifying and predicting fire behavior, taking weather observations, documenting observed fire behavior, and sampling fuel moistures. The unit builds on your knowledge of the environmental observations gained in S290 Intermediate Fire Behavior. If you need to review the basics, refer to S290 Units 9, Observing the Weather, Units 11 and 12, Extreme Fire Behavior and Gauging Fire Behavior and Guiding Fire Line Decisions, and Unit 10, Fuel Moisture. This unit has three parts. Lesson 1, Fire Weather and Extreme Atmospheric Conditions. Lesson 2, Fire Behavior Observations. And Lesson 3, Measuring Fuel Moisture. In Lesson 1, we'll cover the finer points of making weather observations and recognizing atmospheric conditions that can contribute to extreme fire behavior. Upon completion of this lesson, you should be able to demonstrate the ability to observe and document fire weather factors and recognize and report atmospheric characteristics that influence critical fire behavior. These objectives are directly related to tasks number 16 and number 20 in the position task book. We'll start with some of the finer points of observing the weather, a common task for field observers and fire effects monitors. Making accurate weather observations and communicating the observations is vitally important to effective and safe fire management activities for several reasons. Most importantly, unexpected changes in fire behavior due to sudden changes in weather have been a leading factor in firefighter entrapments and fatalities. Your observations are also critical for improving the accuracy of spot weather forecasts and fire behavior predictions. In addition, well-documented weather observations form the basis for reconstruction of serious accidents and other unexpected outcomes, leading to safer and more effective fire management. In this section, we'll briefly review basic weather observations covered in S290, concentrating on the finer points and common mistakes. We'll use this form to note fire weather observations. Keep in mind that there is no standard form used consistently throughout the fire management world, but most are very similar to this one. The fire name, date, and observer's boxes are all specific to the incident and self-explanatory. We covered determining the elevation, aspect, and percent slope in the unit on mapping. We'll briefly review some of the hourly weather observations that were covered in S290, and then We'll look at the environmental observations needed to calculate fine dead fuel moisture and probability of ignition. Although these calculations aren't really weather observations per se, weather observers on fire incidents are commonly tasked with figuring out these critical indicators as part of their hourly weather readings. We'll finish up this lesson with a discussion of some extreme atmospheric conditions and their effects on fire behavior. These extreme atmospheric conditions should be noted in the comment section of the form as well as communicated to fireline personnel. If you are assigned to make weather observations, every hour is the usual frequency, but more often may be necessary if conditions are changing or critical changes are expected. Consult with your incident supervisor to verify the expected frequency. Carefully note the date, time, and location of each weather observation. Include elevation, aspect, and percent slope whenever possible. If the observer is changing locations, this becomes even more important. Regardless of whether the fire is a prescribed fire project or a wildfire, the weather observer should strive to choose observation sites that most accurately reflect environmental conditions around the fire's location. Consider whether to take a weather observation on a ridgetop, mid-slope, or drainage bottom location. Is the fire site exposed or sheltered? What is the aspect and slope? The choice of observation sites should reflect the type of terrain the fire front is most actively burning in. Selecting an unrepresentative site will result in weather observations that don't truly reflect the environmental conditions of that incident, division, or burn site. Once safe representative sites have been selected, the weather observer should try to take the observations in the same fuel type the fire is most active in. If the fire is spreading in timber litter, try to take the observations in similar unburned timber. The same is true for shrub or grass fuel types. The weather observer should avoid taking observations in the black since burned areas tend to be unrepresentatively warm and dry. 
if the observer has no choice but to take an observation in the black, it is important to note this in the remarks section of the log. Attempt to find a safe site upwind of the burned area if at all possible. The weather observer should also take care to minimize localized weather effects generated by the fire itself. Take weather observations away from gusty indraft breezes and radiant heat in the vicinity of the flaming front. These are very localized conditions that don't reflect the area's general conditions. Generally, well-ventilated areas in the shade are desirable spots for belt weather kits to be most effective. Some important points about eye-level wind observations include the following. The observer should take care to face directly into the wind and closely observe the wind speed indicator fluctuations. Remember, the wind direction is defined as the direction the wind is coming from. Exposure to sunlight is not a concern during the wind observation. A time-saving strategy is to conduct the wind observation while the temperature sensor is acclimatizing to ambient conditions. An eye-level wind speed measurement requires at least one full minute of sampling and preferably more. When using the Dweer tube, the wind anemometer that comes standard with the belt weather kit, test the ball and the meter for free movement. Static electrical charge buildup, moisture, or dirt can clog the ball in the tube. Mentally average the wind speed and note the peak gust during the sampling period. Electronic sensors make wind averaging easy. They are more accurate and preferred for eye-level wind speed observations. Regardless of whether the kit is a traditional sling psychrometer or electronic sensor, get into the habit of letting it acclimatize for several minutes in a shaded, breezy area before beginning an observation. This allows the sensors to gradually adjust to environmental temperature and humidity. Avoid exposing the kit to body heat, sweat, ash, dirt, and direct sunlight. The observer should be careful to store the kit in locations away from temperature extremes, such as vehicle dashboards or in line gear pockets. Avoid direct sunlight during temperature and humidity observation. The wet bulb, dry bulb observation must be taken in shade, even if the site is grassy, that is, no shadows from an overstory. The instrument must be protected from direct sunlight. If necessary, the weather observer can use his or her own body shadow to avoid exposing the kit to sunlight. When using a traditional sling psychrometer, be sure the wick is thoroughly wetted before beginning to swing. Distilled water is preferred. Bottled water is the next best alternative. New wicks may tend to repel water droplets from the wet bulb, so the observer may need to gently rub the wick against the side of the water bottle to eliminate air pockets. A soaked wick is the goal continue swinging the sling psychrometer until the wet bulb temperature is reached. This may take several minutes. Continue to check the wet bulb temperature every 30 seconds until it reaches its lowest value. In very dry conditions, it may be necessary to re-wet and continue swinging until the lowest value is attained. When the wet bulb temperature ceases descending, the correct value has been reached. Read and record the dry bulb immediately after the lowest wet bulb reading is obtained. When wet bulb and dry bulb temperatures have been determined, compute the dew point and relative humidity using the paper tables included with the kit. Select the appropriate table for the altitude range corresponding to the observation site. Plastic slide rules for computing dew point and humidity should only be used if printed tables are not available. Use of the printed tables will provide greater accuracy. Well-maintained sling psychrometers are still the most accurate durable, and reliable indicators of temperature and moisture. They function as well in extreme conditions as in moderate conditions. Electronic temperature and humidity sensors should regularly be calibrated against weather instruments of reliable accuracy. Check that the batteries are fresh. Cloud cover reduces the amount of solar radiation affecting fuel temperatures. Estimate the percentage of sky obscured by clouds to the nearest 10%. Remember, smoke can also act as cloud cover by reducing the amount of sun reaching the surface fuels. If heavy smoke limits the amount of sunlight reaching the fuels of interest, consider the smoke coverage in your estimated percentage. Canopy closure is usually given in percent. For our purposes here, an estimate to the closest 10% is adequate. Look up. How much of the sky is visible? If you can see approximately 30% of the sky, then the canopy cover is around 70%. When the sky is clear, what percentage of the ground has sunlight on it? If 20% of the ground is lit by the sun, there is 80% canopy cover. 
If the total of the cloud cover and the canopy cover is less than 50%, the fuels are considered exposed. If the cloud cover plus the canopy cover is 50% or greater, the fuels are shaded. Enter E or S in this column. Some forms use the term unshaded, symbolized by U, instead of exposed. In S290, you learn the process for determining fine dead fuel moisture using reference fuel moisture and correction tables. These tables can be found in the Incident Response Pocket Guide, in the Fireline Handbook, and in the Standard Issue Belt Weather Kits. Before you begin making the calculations, gather the basic information you will need. What time is it? What month is it? Where is the fire? Is it below, above, or level with where you are making the weather observations? Remember, if there is more than 2,000 foot difference in elevation between you and the fire, you are not in a representative location. Consider selecting a different area. Take a moment to review this process by calculating the fine dead fuel moisture for the following inputs. You'll want to write this information down to refer to in the following slides. Date, August 12th. Time, 1630. Location, you are taking the weather observations 1200 feet below the fire. Remember, where is the fire? Current temperature, 81 degrees. Relative humidity, 29%. Slope, 20%. Aspect, west. Exposure, 20% canopy cover, 10% cloud cover. First, use this table to calculate your reference fuel moisture. Remember, these tables can be found in the Incident Response Pocket Guide, in the Fireline Handbook, and in the standard issue belt weather kits. Pause the lesson now while you calculate the reference fuel moisture. Restart the lesson when you finished. The correct answer for your reference fuel moisture is 4. Now you will need to add the dead fuel moisture content correction to account for the environmental conditions in the area where you are taking the weather. Using this chart, calculate the dead fuel moisture content correction and add it to the reference fuel moisture. Here are two important tips to keep in mind when using the correction charts. B, below, L, level, and A, above, refer to where the fire is compared to your location. We've supplied the correction chart for the month of August. Always make sure you are using the correct chart for the month. There are three different charts supplied in the reference material, and it's a common mistake to use the wrong one. Your answer for the moisture content correction should be 3%. If you add the reference fuel moisture of 4% to this correction, the fine dead fuel moisture is 7%. Now let's use this information to calculate the probability of ignition. Probability of ignition is used to determine the likelihood that a glowing firebrand will ignite a fire if it lands on receptive fuels. Whether a wildland fire actually results from the ignition depends on the fire environment and whether conditions would support fire spread. In other words, the probability of ignition is the chance that the firebrand will cause an ignition when the right kind of firebrand lands on the right kind of fuel. Whether wildland fire actually results from the ignition depends on the fire environment's ability to support and sustain burning. The probability of ignition is calculated from the temperature and the fine dead fuel moisture combined with the shading. These values take into account how dry the fuels are and how close they are to their ignition temperature. Use the information from the previous example to calculate the probability of ignition. You should have calculated the probability of ignition is 50%. FEMOs and FOBs are routinely expected to make and report weather observations and calculate fine dead fuel moisture and probability of ignition. These values should be included in your hourly report over the radio. Therefore, it is critical that you are practiced and competent in the skills needed to make accurate observations and reliable reports. If you need to review this process or any of the basic weather observation skills, return to the course material for S290. An online version of S290 can be accessed at the internet address shown on this slide. Unit 9, Observing the Weather, is an excellent source of detailed information on making weather observations and maintaining the instruments in the belt weather kit. The fine dead fuel moisture instructions are in Unit 10 and the probability of ignition information is in Unit 11. Careful record keeping is as important to the weather observation process as every other step. 
it's a good idea for the observer to double-check recorded values for obvious errors before logging and submitting. Some good practices when documenting your weather observations include the following. Double-check to ensure the proper values are noted in their respective columns of the observation form. Don't confuse the wet bulb, dry bulb, and dew point temperatures. This is a frequent source of error. Compare the latest weather observation against those taken during previous hours. Stay alert for any obvious discrepancies. Weather conditions naturally fluctuate during the course of a day, but large changes may indicate either a significant weather event or an instrument malfunction. To reduce potential errors, it is a good idea to cross-check weather observations with nearby observers. Use clear penmanship. Observations that aren't readable aren't usable. Use the remarks column to log significant features such as cumulus buildup or thunderstorms, lightning, sudden wind shifts or changes in wind speed, changing cloud cover, dust clouds radiating from downdraft impacts, inversions, dust devils, showers or virga, or other significant changes since the last observation. Lastly, it's a good idea to remark whether the observations were made with an electronic weather sensor or traditional sling psychrometer. In communicating your weather observations by radio or phone, keep these tips in mind. Record the time on your observation form or in your log. Report the magnitude and direction of the change from the previous observation. For example, rather than just reporting that the dry bulb temperature this hour is 78 degrees, Add that this temperature is up to if the dry bulb temperature was 76 degrees in your previous report. Immediately report weather conditions that could be hazardous. Don't wait for your regularly scheduled report time. Now we'll look at some atmospheric conditions that you would want to note in the comments column of the fire weather observations form. And in some cases, communicate by radio to fireline personnel. Most of the atmospheric conditions we are interested in monitoring are related to the stability of the atmosphere. Stability of the lower atmosphere is evaluated using the vertical distribution of temperature. The atmosphere is considered stable if parcels of air resist vertical displacement, meaning convection is suppressed. If the lower atmosphere is very unstable, it allows for more vertical movement of air, which can contribute to the development of potentially dangerous thunderstorms, large fire plumes, or fire whirls. First, Let's look at atmospheric stability in general, then we'll move on to discussing some specific weather phenomena associated with instability. When sizing up atmospheric stability, we are most concerned with an unstable air mass that provides the potential for vertical fire development and rapid growth. Indicators of an unstable air mass include good visibility, gusty winds, dust devils, cumulus clouds, castellatus clouds, and smoke rising straight up. When you observe these indicators, a fire will have the potential to develop in the vertical direction and grow rapidly. Conversely, these indicators tell you that the air mass around you is stable. Poor visibility, fog, smoke, haze, etc. Steady winds, not gusty. Stratus clouds, no defined smoke column, not rising straight up. When you observe these indicators, the atmosphere is resisting vertical motion and fire behavior will usually not be intense. Inversions are a strong indicator of a stable atmosphere. They commonly occur when cool air off slopes, pools and basins and valleys. They most often start to form in the early evening and strengthen overnight. The cool air under an inversion is usually moist and the fuel moisture is typically higher. Fire behavior is usually reduced under the inversion. When an inversion begins to lift or break, the air mass is in transition from stable to unstable. The behavior of a fire burning beneath an inversion may increase abruptly when the inversion is destroyed. Inversions lift or break as a result of either winds that mix and scour the stable air, or of the heating and lifting effect of solar radiation as the sun warms the stable air mass. Inversions tend to set a pattern for the time of day that they lift or break. If you are aware of this pattern, you can anticipate that fire behavior will change accordingly. In general, remember and document these indicators that can tell you and other fireline personnel whether the surrounding air mass is stable or unstable. 
As instability increases, you can expect increased fire behavior, rapid growth, and greater vertical movement of the fire into the crowns, along with the potential for vertical plume development. Next, we'll cover some specific weather phenomena associated with unstable atmospheric conditions. These weather events represent a significant safety concern for fireland personnel, and you should communicate your initial observations of them immediately. Immediate communication is especially critical if the event was not forecast, expected, and mitigated for in the operational period plan. Thunderstorms often accompany unstable air masses, and they have several characteristics that are critically important to fire operations. First is the fire starting potential of cloud to ground lightning. Lightning is also a major safety concern that can cause injury to fire personnel. Second is the wind associated with thunderstorm inflow, outflow, and downdrafts. These winds can change both direction and speed very suddenly, directly affecting both the spread and intensity of the fire. Mature thunderstorms exhibit both inflow and downdraft winds. Inflow winds, which feed the thunderstorm's updraft, have sustained speeds ranging from 10 to 20 miles per hour with higher gusts. Downdrafts are the downward flowing air currents occurring typically in the forward part of the storm. Downdraft winds can be cooler and are usually stronger reaching speeds of 25 to 35 miles per hour with gusts over 60 miles per hour. Downdrafts can travel in any direction when they hit the ground. Virga may also be observed Virga is the rain that does not reach the ground. This is a good indicator that downdrafts have begun. Remember, the lightning and wind gusts associated with thunder cells can occur miles away from the cell itself. Communicate and prepare for these hazards well before the cell reaches you. Detailed safety precautions on protecting yourself from lightning strikes can be found in the Incident Response Pocket Guide. A cold front is a boundary separating a cold air mass from a warm air mass. They usually move across the U.S. from west to east, but a north to south movement is not uncommon, particularly in regions east of the Continental Divide. As the front nears, wind direction swings around in a clockwise direction. For example, an east wind prior to the frontal passage will shift to the south and then to the west as the cold front passes. Wind speeds also strengthen. The increasing winds and unstable atmosphere create a favorable burning environment, often resulting in large fire growth and extreme fire behavior. Shifts in wind direction can change the direction of spread and the location of the fire front. As wind speeds pick up and the atmosphere becomes less stable, fire brand transport is significantly increased. Spotting is very likely in these situations, driven by strong and erratic winds. This combination of strong, gusty winds and dry, unstable air can create critical fire weather conditions that have been a factor in many tragedy fires. If a cold front passage is predicted for the fire area, be looking for and report the increase in wind speed and the shift in wind direction. Expect strong, gusty winds shifting in a clockwise direction with increased spotting. Fire whirls are whirlwinds occurring within a fire and are caused by very high fire intensity in a local area. A fire whirl can carry flames and burning materials up into its column. Both dust devils and fire whirls can scatter fire, causing spotting across control lines and increasing fire intensity in local areas. Some common factors associated with the formation of fire whirls are intense heat source for multiple fires and or heavy fuels, an unstable atmosphere with extremely low humidity, and a source of vorticity or twisting force, such as terrain-influenced wind eddies, wind shears, or frontal passages. Fire whirls can move in any direction, independent of atmospheric winds, and can generate their own tornado-strength winds, causing spotting in all directions. Next, you'll watch a video of a fire whirl that occurred on the Johnson Fire in Utah. What indicators of an unstable atmosphere can you observe? What other factors associated with the formation of fire whirls are present?
all running away, but yet people walk across the road. Yeah. Todd's got your hard hat sitting on the uh, lead dog. What battery is That was that. Yeah, that was a What indicators of an unstable atmosphere did you observe in this video? In summary, this lesson discussed techniques for taking accurate weather observations to improve spot weather forecasts fire behavior predictions, and firefighter safety, the lesson emphasized the need to document observations clearly and double-check for mistakes before reporting the observations. Most importantly, the lesson covered weather phenomena that could have an immediate impact on fire behavior and fireline safety and the importance of reporting these observations to fireline personnel. These events include thunderstorm activity, cold front wind shifts, and signs of increasing atmospheric instability. We'll next move on to making and documenting fire behavior observations and understanding critical changes in fire behavior.